the Rectangular Waveguide. So in this lecture, I'll briefly introduce the metallic rectangular waveguide that's illustrated here, and we'll step through the TM and TE analysis. We are not going to step through a TEM analysis because it does not support a TEM mode. It's not a transmission line, only one conductor. We'll visualize the modes, try to understand what's going on there, and that will be it. So what is a rectangular waveguide? Well, it's a rectangular pipe. So we will have metal, a very nice electrical conductor going all the way around the outside. And the inside will be filled with a dielectric of some sort. And for this analysis, we are assuming that that dielectric or the material fill is homogeneous. So we're not looking at the inhomogeneous case because then it would not support TE and TM modes to even analyze, and it will become a hybrid mode analysis. The other thing is the convention is that the width of the guide is longer than its height. So it's very rare to specify a rectangular waveguide where the height, this parameter B, would be greater than its width A. So the convention is that A is greater than B. Now, when we analyze this, this is a great waveguide to analyze after parallel plates because the rectangular waveguide is very much like two parallel plate capacitors. And I'm trying to visualize this on the right. So we have two parallel plates. One would confine vertically. The other would confine horizontally. If we overlap them, we get a little channel down the middle. And that is very much like our rectangular waveguide. And so when we analyze this, we're going to have that in mind. So it's a great waveguide to analyze right after analyzing parallel plate waveguides. Uh, almost all the concepts we discussed in parallel plates will arise again when we talk about a rectangular waveguide. Before we jump into the analysis, let's just go through some notes on the rectangular waveguide. It's probably the most classic example of a channel waveguide, and that's because it's very simple to analyze. Practically, it was one of the first waveguides used for microwave frequencies. As I mentioned, transmission lines above you know, 5 to 10 gigahertz or so, depending on what you're doing, become very lossy, and waveguides are the preferred way to pipe electromagnetic energy. Even at lower frequencies and at very high power, waveguides will be preferred. It's not a transmission line, and that's because it only has one conductor. This means it will not support a TEM mode, so we're not going to bother to try to analyze that for the rectangular waveguide. So, it does not support a TEM mode. The TEM mode does not have a low frequency cutoff, whereas TE and TM modes do. That means there's a certain frequency below which this rectangular waveguide is completely useless. It is a paperweight, does not support any guided modes. And that's interesting about it. Let's first do the TE analysis, and a bit like the parallel plate waveguide, this is actually the harder analysis, a little bit harder than TM, and that has to do with how we apply the boundary conditions. So let's jump right into it. So for TE analysis, we have our governing equation just like we did for the parallel plate. Since we're doing TE analysis, that means that the Z component of the electric field is zero, so our differential equation is solving for the Z component of H. And we had a Laplacian in this equation that we've expanded into Cartesian coordinates. Once we solve this and we have a expression for H, well then we can substitute it back into these equations to calculate all of the other field components. So first, we will write the general form of the solution. So we're solving for the Z component of H. And so we have the product of two terms. We have this amplitude term, which is a picture of the mode in the cross section. So it's only a function of X and Y. Uh, 
And then we have the e to the minus j beta z. That's what's responsible for accumulating phase in the z direction, the oscillations in the z direction. Now here's where, when we look at this rectangular waveguide, we're looking at it as if it's two parallel plate waveguides. That analogy, I think, will make this a lot easier. So if we weren't drawing that picture, or we were just a mathematician, we would say that we're going to solve this by separation of variables. That means this amplitude term, we're going to write as the product of two one-dimensional functions. Capital X here is the one that varies only along X, and capital Y will be the one that varies only along the Y direction. And so this X will very much be like our horizontal parallel plate, and the Y will be very much like our vertical parallel plate. So let's go ahead and apply separation of variables. So we start with our governing differential equation. We recognize that we're going to write our unknown function, the h naught z. We'll write that as the product of two one-dimensional functions. So we will then substitute that into our differential equation. And we end up here. Now notice I dropped this parenthesis x, parenthesis y notation. Technically, they should be here, but just for simplicity, I've dropped them. So we've written our differential equation again, but now having substituted h for x times y. Now we notice in this first derivative that y is not a function at all of x. It is able to come to the outside. And we brought it to the outside down here. Likewise, in our second derivative, x is not a function of y, and so we bring it to the outside. Then last, our partial derivatives are written as ordinary derivatives. Because if we look up here, we have a partial derivative with respect to x of a function that is only a function of x. So the partial becomes an ordinary derivative. And I can say the same thing about this second partial derivative. It's a partial derivative with respect to y, but capital Y is only a function of y. So the partial derivative is written as an ordinary derivative. So here is a new differential equation for us to solve. Let's first focus on the x dependence in this differential equation. So we're focusing on this term, which really means the rest of this stuff inside the differential equation is just a constant. To make this look like a wave equation, let's take this group of constants and let's just call it minus kx squared. And the reason we give it a minus kx squared is so that when we replace this with a minus kx squared, our differential equation is the wave equation. It's the wave equation in the x direction. Now let's take the same differential equation. I juggled terms around a little bit. I brought the minus kc over here. Let's focus on the y dependence. So all of the y dependent stuff is right here. And that means the rest of these terms are a constant in this equation. So let's replace that with a minus ky squared. That makes our differential equation a wave equation. That's only a function of y. So we've converted our single differential equation, which is a function of x and y, really into two one-dimensional wave equations. One's only a function of x, the other's only a function of y. That is the separation of variables. We will solve these separately and then bring the solutions together. Let's do something to see if what we've done up to this point is correct. If these two one-dimensional wave equations really do represent our original single differential equation, we should be able to add them together and recover the original differential equation. So the first thing I'll do is I'll rewrite those equations, but the first equation I divide by big X, and in the second equation I divide by big Y. So there's no big X to the right of KX, it's now we're dividing by one over big X here, we're dividing by one over big Y. So same equations, we've just divided by big X and big Y. 
let's go ahead and add these two together and we end up with a new equation. Now let's compare this to our original differential equation. So in blue at the bottom right, this is our original differential equation. And what we can see is that these two really are the same thing if we define kx squared plus ky squared as kc squared. So we can easily do that. And we do recover our original differential equation from both of these. So another sort of justification of this separation of variables. So we have two differential equations to solve. We've actually already solved these. We solved these when we looked at the parallel plate waveguide. So we know their solutions. We know it's a cosine plus a sine. And we can just go ahead and write that immediately. They have different constants. So our solution in X will have an A and a B. And Y will have two other constants, but we can't call this A and B because these are different constants. So we have to call them C and D. Otherwise, it's the same solution we did for parallel plates. Now that we have a solution for X and Y, we can bring them together. Remember, we originally wrote our solution for H naught Z as the product of X and Y. So if we multiply together these two general solutions, we now finally have the overall general solution for H naught Z solved by separation of variables. Now to solve for those constants A, B, C, and D, we're going to apply the boundary conditions. We have an electric conductor around the outside of this waveguide. So for an electric conductor, that forces the tangential components of the electric field to zero at the interface immediately up against the metals. Well, the problem is we've just found the magnetic field. Our boundary condition is a boundary condition for the electric fields. So what we'll have to do is we'll have to take our solution for H naught Z and then use that to come up with general expressions for E naught X and E naught Y. So we can do that. We have these expressions to calculate all the other field component from H naught Z. And so that's what's done here. And so we come up with a general expression for the solution E naught X and the general solution for E naught Y. So it's these two equations then that we will apply our boundary conditions to figure out what is A, B, C, and D. So let's apply the boundary condition at the x equals zero boundary. We apply this to E naught Y and we're going to set x equal to zero. So we're setting x equal to zero. Of course, sine of zero is zero, so this term disappears. Cosine of zero is one, so we're really just left with B. Now for this whole expression to equal zero, that means that B has to equal zero. So we found B and we can drop that term off of the general solution. Now we'll do the boundary condition at the far right hand side of our rectangular waveguide. So that's where X equals A. So we're applying this still to E naught Y and we set X equal to A. So here X is equal to A. Notice the other term is gone because we've already found that B equals zero. So the second term in the square brackets is not there. So for this entire expression to equal zero, well, we could set A equal to zero, but similar what happened with the parallel plate waveguide, we'll recognize if we set A to zero, the entire general solution goes to zero, and that makes no sense. We don't have a physical answer there. So that's not an option. So something else must be forcing this to zero, and it turns out it's the sine term. So we have to set that sine term to zero. Now, when we do that, we recognize that this sine will equal zero anytime its argument is an integer multiple of pi. And so any integer multiple pi will work. And that's the origin of having multiple discrete modes in this waveguide. Now, our integer m could be zero, one, two, three, or whatever. And remember with parallel plates, we weren't quite sure if the m equals zero solution is valid or not. 
This is something we will look at later. For right now, we'll just pretend that it's a valid solution, but we'll come back and figure out what conditions that can be zero, maybe or maybe not. Now we move on to the boundary conditions at the top and the bottom of the rectangular waveguide. So let's look at the bottom, y equals zero. We apply this boundary condition to E naught x because this is the electric field component that's tangential to the top and bottom plates. And we set y equal to zero. So over here, we're setting y equal to zero. Of course, sine zero is equal to zero. So this whole term drops. Cosine of zero is one. We're just left with D. And of course, to make this entire expression zero, D has to be zero. Now let's look at the boundary condition at the top of the rectangular wave bed. That's at y equals b. So we're still applying this to e naught x. We set y equal to b. Uh, over here, we have a minus c sine kyb. The d term that was over here is gone because we found that d equals 0. Now if we set c equal to 0, then our entire solution is 0, and that's not physical. That can't be. Therefore, it has to be the sine term that's making this entire expression zero. So if we set the sine term to zero, its argument could be any integer multiple of pi. So kyb has to be any integer multiple of pi. Now here I'm using n to be the integer instead of m like on the previous slide. And for now, we will let n be zero, one, two, three, and we'll figure out if zero is valid or not. We'll, we'll pick that up later. So this is an origin of multiple modes again. And now we actually have two integers to think about, m and n. So here's our revised solution now for h not z. We found that b and d are both zero. That means the general expression for h not z just becomes this, looking pretty simple. And our two constants, a and c, we were never able to find. However, a times c, if those are just two unknown constants, becomes just one unknown constant. So we're going to write this as a sub mn. And that's gonna remind us this is the amplitude of the mode number that we're indicating with a choice of both m and n. So we will call this the 0, 1 mode or 1, 1 mode, etc. So that's our general expression for H not Z after applying the boundary conditions. So remember what KX and KY were. We had KX being M pi over A. We had KY being N pi over B. And so we can write our general expression for H not Z a little bit differently that doesn't have KX and KY in it. Now, if we take that general expression, plug it back into our original equations where we calculate all of the other field components from H not Z, we end up here. And of course, really the last final thing to do is for the field solution, for the overall fields, we need to tack on the e to the minus j beta z. Notice what we've done with beta here, beta sub mn. Each mode has its own phase constant. So we just give it the subscript mn so we can assign each mode its own phase constant and its own amplitude term, a m n. Now let's think about the phase constant. Remember from separation of variables, this kc we found had to be kx squared plus ky squared to make the separations of variables valid. Well, we know now that kx is m pi over a and ky is n pi over b. So now we have an expression for kc squared in terms of these integers m and n and the dimensions of the waveguide a and b. From this, we get our phase constant. So the original definition of this cutoff wave number was k squared minus beta squared. So we'll solve it for beta squared, k squared minus kc squared. We have an expression for kc, and now we have an overall expression for our phase constant in terms of m, n, a, and b, 
and of course little k. So clearly each mode indicated by m and n has its own phase constant. Now on to the cutoff frequency. So we'll back up to where we're using the cutoff wave number in our definition of our phase constant. We have the square root of two numbers. And this is the phase constant should be real. That means the argument inside the square root has to be positive. If this goes negative, we will get an imaginary beta and that does not make any sense. That actually corresponds to a cutoff mode. So we need k squared greater than kc squared to be talking about a guided mode. And this is why we call the, the kc our cutoff wave number and why it actually controls what is our cutoff frequency. So we need big, we need k greater than kc. And so from this, we can calculate a cutoff frequency just like we did for the parallel plate waveguides. So we need k greater than kc. We know that k is omega times square root of mu epsilon, so here's our frequency term that appears. We can convert our angular frequency to an ordinary frequency, and I put a sub c here to remind us that we're calculating a cutoff frequency from kc. And so now we can replace kc with the m pi over a squared, m pi over b squared, square root of that, and we have a nice equation now for calculating the cutoff frequencies for our TE modes. Characteristic impedance. So the characteristic impedance is the amplitude of E divided by the amplitude of H. And we have expressions for those now. So we can work through the math and simplify. And we have an expression now for the characteristic impedance. And we also have an expression for our phase constant. So we are actually able to calculate the impedance of our TE modes. Let's think about the cutoff for the first order TE mode. And remember, this is the frequency below this. Our waveguide is completely useless. So we write our, our equation for the cutoff frequency. And let's think about this. What about the TE00 mode? Let's plug in 00 for M and N. Well, if we do that, we get a cutoff frequency of zero. That doesn't make any sense. We know that this is not a transmission line. It has to have a cutoff frequency. So what we conclude is that when M and N are both zero, that is not a valid mode. So the TE00 mode does not exist. What about the TE01 mode? Well, if we plug in zero for M and one for N, we actually get an answer for the cutoff frequency. So this is a physical mode. What about the TE10 mode? So we plug in one for M, zero for N, and we get another cutoff frequency. So this is a physical mode and it exists. Now the question is, which one is the lower frequency? Well, both of these equations have a two, they both have a mu epsilon, so it's really the one over B and the one over A that's going to determine which one is the smaller or lower cutoff frequency. So in our convention, and we're having a rectangular waveguide, we do this such that A is always greater than B. So if A is greater than B, then A is going to be the bigger number, so dividing by A will lead to the smaller number. That makes the TE10 mode the lowest order of the TE modes. And I'll add that we can't yet conclude that this is the fundamental mode of the waveguide simply because we haven't looked at the TM modes. It might be that the lowest order TM mode has a lower cutoff frequency than the lowest order TE mode. We don't know that yet because not, we have not analyzed the TM modes. But among the TE modes, the TE10 is the lowest order. Now, if for some reason you were violating convention and you made B greater than A, then it would be the TE01 mode that is the lowest order. But we don't do that. Our convention is that A is always greater than B. Let's think about single mode operation. 
over what range of frequencies would a rectangular waveguide support only that first order TE mode? So we know that, that first order TE mode has a low frequency cutoff. We'll have to operate above it. But at some frequency, if we keep going high enough, suddenly a second order mode will come alive. And then it's now multi-moded. We would have two possible modes. So for what range of frequencies is this single moded? And we very often want to do this. Remember the different modes are traveling at different speeds and that can mess up our signals. So normally we want to operate a waveguide as single mode. All right, so the low frequency cutoff. We know the low frequency cutoff. It's the TE10 mode. But what about the cutoff of the next order mode? We actually don't know what the second order mode is. So is it the TE01? Is it the TE11? Is it the TE20? We have to consider all that. But those are the possibilities for the next lowest order mode above the TE10. So I derived expressions for all three. And if we stare at this long enough, we can actually figure out which of those is the next lowest order mode above the TE10. So right away, we can conclude that the TE11 is always going to have a higher cutoff frequency than TE01. And that's simply because the bigger these indices, the higher the cutoff frequency. And so they share the one in the second place, but the TE01 has a zero. So it has to be a lower frequency. So right away, we can eliminate TE11. But now, which is a lower frequency, the TE01 or the TE20? And it actually turns out it depends on the relation of A and B. And it turns out that if our dimension A is less than twice of B, then it's the TE01 that will be the low frequency cutoff. If this dimension A is greater than 2B, then it's the TE20. And this honestly is the typical cutoff. If you've ever looked at pictures of rectangular waveguides, if you go and Google that, you will notice they are very rectangular. And so that is the usual case. And so the TE20 is almost always the next order mode that would pop into existence. But just remember, if A and B are a little closer, then it's actually the TE01 mode that would be the next. So what's the bandwidth of our rectangular waveguide? So let's go with the usual case where A is greater than twice of B. Now we have our upper and lower cutoff frequencies. And so our bandwidth is the difference of those. And our bandwidth reduces to this nice simple equation. Now, I want to introduce another concept, something called fractional bandwidth. And here is why that's meaningful. Let's say I have a waveguide design and I get some bandwidth. Let's say the bandwidth is one gigahertz. If I take that waveguide and I shrink all physical dimensions by two, so it's half the size in all ways, it turns out the bandwidth will double. And that's because it's operating at a higher frequency now. However, it's really the same waveguide, just scaled. So we would like some measure of bandwidth that doesn't change as you scale the size of the waveguide. And it turns out we have that, and it's called the fractional bandwidth. So the fractional bandwidth is the bandwidth normalized by dividing by the center frequency. And if we do that for these two frequencies up above, it turns out we actually get a number, 66.7%. So as long as that A is greater than two times B, really no matter what our choice is of A above that, our bandwidth is always 67%. Fractional bandwidth is 67%. And no matter how we scale that guide, that 67% is always the same. So fractional bandwidth to me is the more meaningful way to measure the bandwidth of a waveguide. Let's do an example. Let's say we have an air-filled rectangular waveguide. That is the most common case, although we could fill it with a dielectric, but let's use air. And let's say that A, the width of the rectangular waveguide is three centimeters, and B is two centimeters. 
So first question is, what is the cutoff frequency of the waveguide? Now, when we say the cutoff frequency, one thing that might be in mind is cutoff frequency of which mode? There's a whole bunch of modes and they each have their own cutoff frequency. So normally when we just say the cutoff frequency, what is meant as the cutoff frequency of the absolute lowest order mode? And so below that, no modes would be supported. Well, we know that cutoff frequency, and given these dimensions, we calculate that to be 5 gigahertz. So if we tried to use this waveguide at 4.9 gigahertz, we just could not squeeze that wave into the waveguide. Our frequency has to be 5 gigahertz or higher in order for that waveguide to support a mode. Next question, over what range of frequencies is the waveguide single mode? Well, we've calculated the lower number, but what's the upper number where the next order mode suddenly pops into existence? And that would be our range of frequencies. Well, in this case, A is not greater than 2B. So the second order mode in this case is the TE01, not the TE20. So we'll plug in our equation for the TE01 mode, and we get 7.5 gigahertz. So our final answer is this waveguide is single mode from 5 to 7.5 gigahertz. Below 5 gigahertz, no modes exist. Above 7.5 gigahertz, we have at least two modes that would be supported by that waveguide. What's the fractional bandwidth of this waveguide? Well, we know the bandwidth. We just calculated it. We can divide by the center frequency. And in this case, the way I'm calculating the center frequency is that I'm averaging the upper and lower frequency. And when I divide by 2, that 2 comes up here and our 100% becomes 200%. So we throw in our numbers and we get 40%. So by making A less than 2B, we've hurt the bandwidth. And this is actually the reason that rectangular waveguides are so rectangular because that's how we maximize the bandwidth of the waveguide. So let's plot the phase constant and effective refractive index for the first and second order modes all the way from DC up to 15 gigahertz. So we need some equations to do that. So we have our phase constant, and if we plug in 1 and 0 for M and N, here's the phase constant we get. If we plug in 0, 1 for M and N, we get a second phase constant. And so we want to plot these as a function of frequency. The effective refractive index, it's really just our phase constant divided by this K0 term. So once we calculate our beta, we divide by K0, and then we'll get our effective refractive index. Okay, given those equations, uh, I've summarized the equations that we derived up here, and down below we're plotting it. The plot on the left is the phase constant, and the plot on the right is the effective refractive index. Let's look first at the phase constant. Remember the low order cutoff frequency was five gigahertz. That's why below that, we don't see any beta. It starts here at 5 gigahertz, and from there it increases. And it has a little elbow region, but at some point it just becomes a straight line. And getting a little bit advanced here in a side topic, we're looking at this curvature here, and that really means that the waveguide is very dispersive. If we have a signal occupying this bandwidth, uh, each of those frequencies are going to be traveling at a different speed. We really want to operate above that low order frequency where this line becomes straight. And that's where they're all gonna have the same effective refractive index. So we tend not to wanna operate right near a cutoff. The second order mode does not exist until 7.5 gigahertz. And then it also increases linearly. And so we can plot the effective refractive index. Notice this is always less than one. That's telling us that these modes in the waveguide must be traveling faster then the speed of light. Does that bother you? Well, let's plot the velocity. 
as a function of frequency, which of course just comes directly from the effective refractive index. So we take the speed of light, divide by our effective refractive index, and we have the velocities. So here's what they look like. Notice right at cutoff, our velocity is huge. It actually approaches infinity. Um, certainly right above that, we have some very fast propagation, but then it sort of converges to, to one. Now we go way up high. So way out here at super high frequencies, the mode in the waveguide is traveling immediately at the speed of light. But realistically, if we're operating this as a single-moded guide, we're operating right here. And the mode actually seems to be traveling faster than the speed of light. So I'll ask it again. Does that bother anybody? What's going on here? So here's a summary of having done the TE analysis of a square waveguide. We have our field solutions on the left. We have our phase constant, our cutoff frequencies, and our characteristic impedance. And the equations, as it turns out, for the phase constant and the cutoff frequency, they're actually the same for the TE and TM modes. We will derive them for the TM mode, but we get the same equations. That's convenient because when we calculate them, it counts for both. We don't have to do more calculations. We'll conclude that the TE00 mode does not exist. So for TE modes, when M and N are both zero, that's not counted. Now M and N can be zero, but not at the same time. We also found that the TE10 is the lowest order TE mode. We're going to repeat everything we just did, but for the TM modes. Let's remember what happens for TM analysis. So TM means transverse magnetic. That means that the longitudinal component of the magnetic field has to be zero. So the magnetic field only has transverse components. Since that's zero, that means the differential equation that we're solving for is for the Z component of E. So that's what we'll proceed with. And once we find an expression for E naught Z, we can plug it into these equations to find all of the other field components, and then we would have obtained our solution. So that's what we're going to do. The general solution for the guide is the electric field is written as the product of two terms. The first is the amplitude profile. It's a picture of our mode in the cross section of the waveguide. So it is only a function of X and Y, and it does not change. The second term is the e to the minus j beta z. This is what's responsible for oscillation or accumulation of phase as our mode is propagating in the z direction. To solve this, we will again look at our rectangular waveguide as sort of the superposition of two parallel plate waveguides. So what we'll be doing is writing our solution as the product of two functions. One is only a function of X, so we'll just call that capital X. The other is only a function of Y, we will call that capital Y. And we can think of each of those, X and Y, as a separate parallel plate waveguide. We'll analyze them as such, and once we get solutions, we will tie it together to get our overall solution for the rectangular waveguide. This is called the separation of variables. So we have our differential equation that we're going to solve. And we know that we're going to let our solution, E naught Z, be the product of two one-dimensional functions. So the first step here is to plug in big X times big Y in place of E naught Z. So when we do that, we end up here. And notice, just to be clear and compact, I'm dropping the parenthesis x and parenthesis y, but, but make no mistake, x, big X is a function of only little x, and big Y is only a function of little y. I've just dropped it here. Now we're going to notice, since big Y is not a function of x, it can come to the outside of the partial derivative. Likewise, since big X is not a function of Y, 
it can come to the outside of the partial derivative. So that's what we did here. Then last, I'm going to divide the entire equation by x and y. So I end up with a 1 over x multiplying this partial derivative and a 1 over y uh, multiplying this, I said partial derivative, I actually meant ordinary derivative. They become ordinary derivatives because this big x is only a function of x. So our derivative becomes ordinary. Likewise, our big y is only a function of y, so our partial derivatives become ordinary. So two things happen at once here. We divided the whole equation by x times y, and our partial derivatives became ordinary derivatives. So here's our new equation with x and y. Let's first think about the x dependence in this differential equation. Everything that depends on x is in this first group of terms. That means in terms of dependence on x, all of these other terms are a constant. So let's actually call that group of terms minus kx squared. And we chose to call it minus kx squared because our differential equation now becomes a one-dimensional wave equation that's easily solved. Next, we will look at the y dependence. All of the y dependent terms are concentrated here. Notice we've moved the minus kc squared term over here, and that's to group it with the x terms. So in terms of y dependence, all of these terms on the left here are a constant. So let's just call that minus ky squared. And why did I choose minus ky squared? That's so our differential equation becomes a one-dimensional wave equation. In this case, in the y direction. So we have taken our single differential equation containing both x and y and have come up with two very simple one-dimensional differential equations. So we will solve these separately and then bring the solutions back together. Again, this is called separation of variables when we do this. So here's our two differential equations and let's test to see if this is making sense. And the way we're going to do this is manipulate those equations, add them together, and see if we recover the original differential equation. So the first thing I'll do is divide the top equation by big X and the bottom equation by big Y. We end up with them in this form. Now we will add those together. At this point, we get a single differential equation, which was the sum of our two smaller differential equations. Let's compare that to the original differential equation. So in blue is the original differential equation. And we can see that these two equations will be the same thing if we let kc squared be equal to kx squared plus ky squared. So that will be our definition for the cutoff wave number, and it will let the separation of variables work for us. So we now have two different differential equations to solve. They're actually the same differential equation. So when we get a general solution from one, we can just copy that and write the general solution for the other. These are the same differential equations that we solved in the parallel plate waveguide. So we can just go ahead and write these immediately. The only difference here is our constants. So for our solution of X, we use A and B. I can't write just A and B for our solution of Y because they're potentially different constants. So I write it as C and D. And they're the same solutions we got for parallel plate waveguides and is really why it's kind of like we're analyzing a parallel plate along X, a parallel plate along Y, and then bringing them together. So now that we have expressions for X and Y, we can multiply them together to get the general solution for E naught Z. So here it is, our general solution. We still have yet to find what A, B, C, and D are, and we do that by applying the boundary conditions. We have an easier job here because E naught Z is already an electric field and tangential to our interfaces. So it's easier than the TE analysis.
So here's our boundary conditions. We don't need E naught X or E naught Y or anything else because E naught Z is tangential to all of the interfaces. So we just apply the boundary conditions to it. Much simpler. Maybe we should have even done the TM analysis first. So our first boundary condition is at the far left hand side of our rectangular waveguide. So this is at X equals to zero. Of course, we're applying this to E naught Z we let x be zero. So in the first set of square brackets, we get a cosine of zero and a sine of zero. The sine of zero equals zero, so this whole term drops. Cosine of zero is one, and we're just left with a. Now, the only thing we can do to get this entire expression to be zero is if a equals zero. So that whole first term drops off. Now we'll look at the boundary conditions at the far right hand side of our rectangular waveguide. So we're letting x equal a, put an x for a. Our first term here is gone because we found that big A equals zero. So this term has to somehow force the entire expression to zero. If we choose B equals zero, that forces our entire solution to zero. That's not physical, that's not correct. So the only thing that can make this expression be zero is if somehow this sine term is forcing things to be zero. So that's exactly what happens. In order for the sine term to be zero, that means the kx times a, the argument of the sine, has to be an integer multiple of pi. This is the origin of multiple discrete modes. So in this case, m equals one, two, three, and so on, and we can't choose zero because that would be a trivial solution. It would force all the fields to be zero, which does not make any sense. So M equals zero is not a choice for us. Now let's look at the boundary conditions at the bottom plate. At the bottom plate, Y equals zero. So we set Y equal to zero. We have a cosine zero, we have a sine zero. When we set y equal to zero, the sine zero equals zero, so this whole term drops away. Cosine of zero equals one, so we're just left with c. So this is our only degree of freedom to make this entire expression be zero. The conclusion is that c equals zero. Now let's look at the boundary condition at the top plate at the top of the rectangular waveguide. This is where y equals b. So we set y equal to b. The term with c in it is gone because we found that c equals zero. So we just have d times sine of ky times b. If we were to choose d equals zero, that would make the entire field solution zero. And that doesn't make any sense. We wouldn't have a solution. That's a trivial solution. Therefore, it has to be this sine term again that's making this expression equal zero. So when we set sine equal to zero, that means the argument has to be an integer multiple of two pi. So n is our integer now, one, two, three. We can't let n be zero because that again would force the entire field solution to be zero and that does not make any sense. This is the origin of our multiple modes and our multiple discrete modes. Now that we've applied the boundary conditions, let's bring all of this together again. We found through the boundary conditions that big A and big C have to equal zero. So our expression for E naught Z reduces to this. And we have this B times D. We weren't able to find values of B times D. Since B times D, they're both unknown constants, their product is still another unknown constant. So we'll just call that B sub M N and B sub M N will be the amplitude of our M N order mode. Remember what we found for K X and K Y when we applied the boundary conditions. K X was M pi over A and K Y was N pi over B. So we can write our field solution this way, eliminating K X and K Y. Remember that neither M nor N can be zero. So if any mode number has a zero in it, 
we can't have that one. That's not valid for the TM modes. So we take this expression, we plug it into our equations for calculating all of the other field components, and we end up here. And of course, the very last thing to do is to tack on this e to the minus j beta z term. And I've included an mn subscript on our beta, and that's indicating that the each of the guided modes has its own phase constant, also has its own amplitude term. Let's think more about the phase constant. Remember our separation of variables, how we were required to define the cutoff wave, wave number as the sum of kx squared plus ky squared? So we found expressions for kx and ky that enforce the boundary conditions. So now we have an expression for our cutoff wave number, just in terms of m, n, a, and b. Originally, our definition of this cutoff wave number was k squared minus beta squared. We can solve this for beta squared, which is now k squared minus kc squared. We have an expression for kc squared that we can plug in down here and solve for our phase constant just in terms of k, m, n, a, and b. So clearly, since m and n are in this equation, the phase constant will be different for each of our modes. Now let's think about the cutoff frequencies. So we have this general equation for beta, and in order for it to be a guided mode, the argument inside the square root has to be positive. So that means that k has to be greater than kc in order to keep that argument positive. That's why we call KC the cutoff wave number, and that's because it defines where cutoff happens. From that, we can figure out the cutoff frequency. So knowing that K has to be greater than KC, we know that K is omega times the square root of mu epsilon. Omega is our angular frequency, so that is 2 pi times the ordinary frequency, the ordinary frequency being the thing that's in hertz. So we solve this for our ordinary frequency, and we can calculate the cutoff of the MN mode. And recall, that's the same equation that we had for the cutoff of our TE modes. So the equation for the cutoff frequencies is the same for TE and TM modes. That's handy because we can calculate both at the same time. The characteristic impedance for the TM modes, it's the amplitude of E over the amplitude of H. So we can plug in our expressions for E and H and simplify, and we have our final expression for calculating the characteristic impedance. And our phase constant now is known because we've done the wave analysis. Let's look at cutoff frequency. So what is the first order mode for the TM modes? Uh, so here's our expression for the cutoff frequencies, but which one is the lowest order mode? So remember, neither M nor N can be zero. So TM00 mode can't exist. TM01 can't exist. TM10. TM anything with a zero anywhere does not exist. So we cannot consider those. So what combination of M and N does minimize FC? Let's give this a bit, of, bit more thought. So it turns out the TM11 is going to have the lo lowest cutoff frequency. And so if we plug in one for both M and N, here's our expression for the cutoff frequency for the TM modes. Now, we can't say that's the totally the, the fundamental cutoff frequency for this waveguide because that's only the cutoff frequency for the TM modes. We would have to look at the TE modes and figure out which of those two actually has the lowest cutoff frequency to figure out which is the fundamental mode. So here's an example. And we're gonna go with the same rectangular waveguide that has a width of three centimeters and a height of two centimeters. What is the cutoff frequency of the waveguide? Well, we know that's when M and N are one, so we plug in all our numbers, 
we get an answer of 9 gigahertz. And I'll remind you again, this is really just the cutoff frequency of the TM modes. The overall absolute cutoff frequency of the waveguide, we'd have to also consider the TE modes. But we're just looking at the TM modes right now. And the TM11, which is the lowest order mode, has a cutoff of 9 gigahertz. So as far as TM modes are concerned, below 9 gigahertz, this is a useless waveguide. Like before, let's plot the phase constant and the effective refractive index, and we're seeing similar things. Below the cutoff frequency, we don't even have a phase constant. It doesn't exist. It's actually imaginary. But right at 9 gigahertz, suddenly we have this phase constant. And the effective refractive index looks very similar. Notice it's also always less than 1. So our TM modes also appear to be traveling faster than the speed of light. I'll say it again, does that bother anybody? So if we take the speed of light divided by our effective refractive index, we can actually plot the velocity. And we can see that you know, below the cutoff, it doesn't even make sense to talk about that velocity. But right at cutoff, the velocity approaches infinity and it falls pretty quickly, but you know it hovers between one and two for a while, eventually way out here at super high frequencies converging to just one. But for the most part, where we're using this, that velocity is greater than one, and it's faster than the speed of light. I hope that's bothering you. So here's a summary of what we've done. On the left is our, all of the fields for the TM modes. We have a way of calculating our phase constants, our cutoff frequencies, and characteristic impedance. The equations for phase constant and cutoff frequency, they're the same as the TE modes. In terms of ordering the modes, M and N, neither of those can be zero. So any mode number that has a zero in it for TM is not a supported mode. And we found that the TM11 is the lowest order TM mode. We can't say that's the absolute lowest order mode because we have not checked the TE modes. Let's visualize some of these modes. That's always fun and I think very instructive. So here's an animation of the TE10 mode. So we have a one in that first position. That means we should see one bright spot in the X direction. And if we look at this mode profile, that's exactly what we see. One bright spot right in the middle. And no bright spots in the zero direction, what we, or the Y direction, sorry. And so we just see uniform field in the Y direction. So notice that mode profile, the E0, that stays the same as the mode propagates. The only thing that's happening is that we're accumulating phase. So if we include that exponential and just show the real part, that's why this bottom picture appears as if it's, it's oscillating in and out. It's simply that mode profile accumulating phase and we're looking at the real component of that. So that's TE10. Let's look at TE20. Now we should expect to see two bright spots in the X direction and that is exactly what we see. TE01, we now have M equals zero, so we shouldn't see really any bright spots in the X direction. And what we see is that the field profile is uniform in the X direction. We have a one in the N position, that's the Y direction, we should see one bright spot vertically. And that's exactly what we're seeing, one bright spot vertically. TE11, we should be seeing one bright spot along X, one bright spot along Y, and that's what we're seeing, one big bright spot in the middle. TE21, should be two bright spots in the X direction, one bright spot in the Y direction. So if we move along X, we see one, two bright spots, and one bright spot in the vertical direction. Uh, maybe it's coming up, but what about these little things up here? Is that three bright spots in the horizontal direction? 
Not really. This middle one is one bright spot. The two on the ends are actually two half bright spots. So if we were to count the bright spots working horizontally along the top or bottom, we're counting two bright spots. And the same argument vertically. If we go vertically, we have two half bright spots in the vertical direction. So that's the TE21 mode. Notice as we get to these higher and higher order modes, they're really looking quite beautiful. TM modes now. We're looking at the lowest order TM mode, the TM11. That means one bright spot along X, one bright spot along Y. Well, along Y, it's pretty obvious, one bright spot. But along X, it seems like we're seeing two bright spots. But again, that bright spot is broken up on the left and the right, and we're looking at two half bright spots going horizontally. And so really, it's still one bright spot horizontally. Now let's conclude what happened here. We need to think about the fundamental mode. What is the fundamental mode? Well, for TE, we found that the lowest order mode is TE01. For TM, we found it was the 1, 1 mode. Well, these have the same equation for cutoff frequencies. So really, whichever has the lower indices is the winner. And so it turns out, the TE01 mode is the fundamental mode in a rectangular waveguide, not the TM modes. So in practice, when these are used as a single-moded waveguide, we are using the TE01 mode. All right, let's do another example. Let's take a waveguide now that has a width of four centimeters and a height of two centimeters. And we ask the question, over what range of frequencies is this waveguide single mode? I have a little trick to show you here. We could sit down with a bunch of equations and work through this, but if you have access to a computer, there's actually a little bit easier way to do this. Here's what I like to do. I like to go to a computer, set up a for loop, a double for loop over M and N, and calculate all of the cutoff frequencies. From there, I will take that list and sort them in order of increasing frequency. And that tells me right away my fundamental mode, the very first order mode, is the TE10 mode. In this case, the next is the TE20 mode. And in fact, the TMs don't even pop up until you know, the, the fourth or so mode. So we immediately see that the TE10 mode is the fundamental mode, and it has a cutoff frequency of 3.74 gigahertz. Well, the question was, over what range of frequencies is this single moded? Well, we just go on our table and find the next frequency. So it is single moded from 3.74 gigahertz up to 7.48 gigahertz. And in practice, that is where we would want to use our waveguide if we desire to use it as a single mode guide. So that's how we write our final answer. That's the range of frequencies that this particular waveguide is single moded. Here's some key points from this lecture. So the rectangular waveguide, it's not a transmission line. We know that because it does not have two conductors. So it does not support a TEM mode because it's not a transmission line, but because we put a homogeneous dielectric in our guide, it does support TE and TM modes. If the dielectric were inhomogeneous, we couldn't do anything we've done here. We'd have to go back and do our hybrid mode analysis, which of course is much more difficult. And I don't even recommend doing that by hand, but it is much easier to do on a computer, in fact. The equations for the cutoff frequencies for T and TM modes are the same, and that's useful because we can calculate them at the same time. We found that the TE00 mode does not exist. For the TM modes, any time M is zero or any time that N is zero, none of those modes exist.
we found that the TE10 is the dominant mode, and that's because it had the lowest cutoff frequency. Now the TM10 mode would have the same cutoff frequency, but remember the TM10 mode does not exist because that would have to have N equal to zero, and that's not a valid choice for the TM modes. The other interesting thing that we keep saying is that the phase velocity of these modes routinely is exceeding the vacuum speed of light. And I hope by now that does bother people. And that is deserving of more explanation. And we're actually going to talk about that in a later lecture. Here's a summary of all the various equations. It's not really meant to be talked through in this video. It's more for you to download the notes and use as a resource.